What if you want to treat multiple related objects as if they were one object? Well, that's an array. You can think of an array as a single variable with multiple compartments for data. All elements of the array must be of the same type. Here's an example. Imagine you have a variable named value that contains a string. Hello there, how are you? You might want to treat that as an entire sentence, or you might want to treat it as a group of individual words. In that case, you might want to have a numbered set of words where zeroth word was hello, then there, how, are, you, each as individual portions of the entire object. So in this case, once we've broken up into words this way, we can work with each individual word, or we can work with the entire collection of words as a string. And that's what an array lets you do. In that diagram, value is a single variable containing a single value. Values is an array containing five values with positions numbered 0 through 4. You can work with the array as a whole, or you can access each individual element. You can iterate through all the elements. You could have filled the array like this. This is one way you might have gotten those values into that values array by calling string.split. String.split is a method that takes in a string and unless you specify otherwise, uses spaces as a delimiter to split the various words out and they return back an array. We can take that array and plop it into our values variable, and now values would refer to the entire group of split up words. If you think about an array, imagine this scenario. You could replace this group of integers, dim week zero as integer, dim week one as integer. I've seen people write code this way. A better solution would be to replace it with a single declaration, dim weeks, indicating the number of weeks, in this case 52, that actually represents the highest numbered element in the array. This array contains 53 elements numbered 0 through 52. To demonstrate working with arrays, let's just jump in and do it. I'll choose option A to step into a procedure which creates for us an array of weeks. Here I'll create an instance of the system.random class, rnd, and then I'll create an array of integers. Notice here that I've declared weeks, open paren 52, close paren. What that does is create an array where each item in the array takes on an index from 0 to 52. I have 53 elements in that array. Remember, the number you specify when you create an array indicates the highest numbered element in the array there's always one more than that elements in the array. There's 53 of them. Okay, so we've created the array, and now for i as integer goes from 0 to 52, that's 53 iterations, I'm going to place into each element of the array a random number. And you index into the array using parentheses, and inside the parentheses we'll have the index we care about. In this case it'll be 0, then 1, then 2, and so on. So we loop through now we can look at that weeks variable and see that we've specified random numbers for the first four elements of the array. I'll put a breakpoint here so you don't have to watch me do that 53 times. I'll press F5 to run full speed. And now we can use a for each loop using an integer as the looping variable to visit each value in weeks. Now right now weeks contains 53 random numbers, and I'd like to visit each one of them. The way the for each loop works is i takes on the value of each element in the week's array. So the first element is 28. So first i will be 28, then 94, then 93, then 22, and so on, and we'll display each value of i in the console window. And there we go. It's important to note that when you're using a for each loop, you have read-only access to the thing you're enumerating through. In this case, since the array contains integers, I can't change the value of those integers from within this for each loop. If I had objects in my array, I could change the properties of that object, but I couldn't change which object, the reference to the object, in the array itself. 
so the access to elements in the array is read-only using a for each loop. You can think of a one-dimensional array as a list of values. Here's a list. We have array values, a bunch of random numbers, and array indexes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. You can have a two-dimensional array. That's a set of rows and columns, and that might look something like this, where we have rows numbered 0, 1, and 2, and columns numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Here we have 18 values in an array with sets of rows and columns. You could think of a three-dimensional array as stacked rows and columns, like a cube. And really, no one uses arrays with more than three dimensions, for the most part, because it's difficult to visualize what that array of values might look like in memory. You don't need to visualize. You want a 17-dimension array? Feel free. It's just that no one will be able to read your code and understand it. Under the covers, all arrays that you create inherit from the system.array class. It doesn't look like that. You never said, give me a new instance of system.array, and you never will. But the fact is, system.array provides the methods and properties your arrays have within your code. And your arrays inherit those methods and properties. It's not going to be clear from the syntax you use that you're creating an instance of system.array, but that's what's going on under the covers. Let's try an extended demo which works through many issues creating and filling arrays. To demonstrate creating and filling arrays, I'll choose option B, and this will drop me into a long procedure that shows off lots of features. I'll start by creating an array of strings named instructors. It's declared with a size of 3, it's not a size, remember, that's the highest numbered element, and your brain should immediately say, oh, I have instructors numbered 0 through 3, or 4 of them. And here I can fill in the values of those 4 instructors. If I go hover over instructors now, I can expand this and see my 4 instructors, numbered 0 through 3. If I want to resize the array and put more instructors in, Phoebe comes to my rescue. There's a redim statement that allows you to redimension the array. The redim keyword says if I want to redim this to hold six instructors, I could redim instructors five, and that would make it have room for six instructors. But that would create a new empty array, throw away my existing ones. Instead, what I want to do is redim preserve instructors five, and that will leave me with room for six instructors, but not throw away my old instructors. Now, you have to understand what's going on. Under the covers, you can't expand an array. .NET doesn't allow it. So when we use the redim keyword, Visual Basic is creating a new instance of an array. When we use redim preserve, they're creating a new instance of an array with a new size and manually copying over the old elements. They do it for you, so you don't have to think about it. So now, instructors has the original four elements and two extras with room for more people. So we'll fill in instructors 4 and instructors 5. OK. At this point, we have an array named instructors with six filled in slots. Now, I can assign a reference to an array. Previously, you talked about or you learned about assigning object references. An array is just an object. So I can define people as an array of strings. And here's the syntax for that. I'm not specifying the size because I just want to get a copy of the reference. So dim people, open close parenthesis, as string, says people is an array of strings. And I'm assigning it equal to the existing array named instructors. Now you need to know that these parentheses here, if you're not assigning a size, can either be on the name of the array or on the data type itself. So I find it more convincing that I use the syntax like this, where I put the parentheses on the name of the array only if I'm assigning a size. Otherwise, I use the syntax like this in my own code because I like to remember that this is an array of strings. I find it easier to see that if the parentheses are on the type, not the name of the variable. 
but either one of them works if you're not assigning a size. If you're assigning a size, you have no choice. You must put the parentheses and the size on the name of the variable itself, not the type. Okay, down here I have people defined as an array of strings. I've assigned it equal to the existing array named instructors. Here's a question for you. I'm going to change the zeroth element of the people array to be Tommy. Well, what is in there right now? Right now, Tom is in there. I'm going to change it to be Tommy. Any guesses what happened to instructors zero? Well, instructor zero was the same thing as people zero. Remember, it's just a reference to the same exact object. When we assigned people zero to be Tommy, we also changed instructor zero. And you can see that. There it is, Tommy. It was Tom, now it's Tommy, because people and instructors refer to the exact same object in memory. Okay, well, you have to get used to that's the way arrays work. They are objects. They're not value types. They're reference types. Okay, if you want to work with an array, you might want to make a clone of it. The array class provides a clone method. You can see I'm calling that here. Instructors.clone returns an array of objects. I need it to be an array of strings so I can work with it as an array of strings. So I can use the C-type operator, which takes any object and lets me cast it to an equivalent type. Well, even though clone returns an array of objects, it's really an array of strings, so we can tell VB to treat it as an array of strings, and we do it by casting it using the C-type operator to cast it as an array of strings. Now we can take friends, a new array, and assign friends to that clone of instructors. Okay, so we're not making a new reference to an existing array, we're actually creating a new object in memory. So friends now refers to a different array altogether. So if I change friends zero, which is currently Tommy, I'm gonna change friends zero to be Brian. Let's look at it now. It is Brian. What do you think's in instructors? Well, remember, we took a copy of instructors. We cloned it. So instructors is still as it was originally. We changed friends to have Brian in that first slot, but instructors still contains Tommy. So if you need to make an actual copy of an array, copying all of its elements somewhere else, the clone method is an easy way to do it. All right, so far we've only seen arrays of simple things, value types like strings. You can also place into an array user-defined objects, your own classes, instances of your own classes anyway. So I have a class named writer in my code, and we'll look at it in a moment. Well, we'll look at it now. Writer has in it a constructor. It's got a default constructor because, as you'll see later, many features in the .NET framework require a default constructor. So you need some way to allow classes to create an instance of your class without passing anything. Generally, your classes should always have a default constructor. Now, in this case, I have properties, name and home state which I've made just as fields of my class to keep it simple. I've also provided a constructor that allows you to pass in name and home state, if you like, to keep things simple. And as I said earlier in a different portion of the course, every class you create probably ought to provide an override for the toString method so that you can find out exactly which writer we're talking about just by calling the toString method. If you want, you can create an instance of this class by calling the default constructor and later supply name and home state. Their values will be null otherwise. Or you can call this constructor passing in name and home state. It's up to you. Let's go back to our code. And here we're going to create an array containing four writers, numbers 0 through 3. And now we're going to add to that writers array individual writer objects. We'll add Andy, who's from Florida, Mary from Florida, Ken from California, and Robert from Washington. And now our array contains all 
of those elements. You can see if we expand each one, that each one it contains the data we supplied. There we go. So your arrays can contain simple objects, can contain value types, or can contain other arrays. It doesn't matter. Each array can contain whatever you want. All right. Now, so far, we've assigned values individually into the array once we created it. You also have the option of assigning values as you create the array. For example, trainers here. Trainers is an array of string. I haven't specified the size. I just said trainers is an array of string. You'll see there's an equal sign, line continuation, so it appears visible, but it's really just one line of code. And in curly braces, you can specify the individual items separated with commas. Here we have Brian, Julie, Ted, Bob, and Don, all listed as trainers. And that array, after this line of code, will contain exactly those items. The length is 5, they're numbered 0 through 4, and those items have been added to the array. So the compiler figured out how big to make the array based on the initialized values you pass in. And you can do this with your own custom objects as well. Here I have authors as an array of writer. And you notice here I put the parentheses in a different spot than I did here just to prove that you can. And here I'm assigning an array. Here's the braces. And the individual elements within the array are new writers. So I have new writer Andy, new writer Mary, and so on. As I run this single line of code, here I am walking into the constructor for the writer class. There we go. I skipped over the rest of it by stepping over the code. Here now, authors contains four writers, just like the original writers array did. OK. You can create multidimensional arrays as well. Here is a declaration for an array that has 50 rows and two columns. They're numbered 0 through 49 and 0 through 1. So here I have my array declared. We can see it here. And the items are numbered row, column, row, column. Here we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, and so on. Row, then column, all the way down through the 100 elements within this array. And then you can assign things into them by row and by column. States 0, 0, states 0, 1. States 1, 0, states 1, 1. And what we have here clearly, back up a second, is a two-dimensional array in which the first column contains the state full name, and the second column contains the state abbreviation. You can see that here. State full name, state abbreviation. State full name, state abbreviation. Now, you can initialize multidimensional arrays at declaration time as well. Here's a declaration for an array containing two columns full of, I did it backwards this time, state abbreviations and state full name. The way you declare it is dim variable name. Notice these parentheses. They have a comma inside. That indicates that what this array will be contains two columns. It'll be row, comma, column. It's a weird syntax, isn't it? Where you have to know that that comma is just representing a placeholder for the comma that will be used in the array. And now I initialize it. I have one set of braces, this and this, for the array itself. Then within each item in the array is an array, too. So this is a two-column array, a two-column array. Each element in the array is itself a two-column array. And we have items listed, short name, full name, as an array element within this two-column array. You'll need to study this syntax to see how it's working. But once I'm done with that one line of code, now states contains all of the states and their abbreviations. Now this one has, actually, if you look at it carefully, this has 108 elements, because I added the territories in addition to the states. I'm not sure why. I must have found a listing on the web of all the states and abbreviations just copied in here. And it includes Virgin Islands and Guam and Puerto Rico and stuff. OK, down here, we have code that shows how you can iterate through or retrieve items from an array. We can retrieve items by their position. Here, let's retrieve instructors 0. Remember our instructors array? 
it contains strings. So instructor zero is Tommy. Let's go look. Yep, Tommy. States two comma one. Well, let's see where that is. Two comma one, there it is, should be the state named Arkansas. We'll go look, it is. Okay, now we can loop by index through an array. So I could do for i as integer equals zero to instructors.length minus one. And this is where it gets tricky. You have to remember to subtract one from the length of the array because otherwise you're going one too far. Remember, if you have an array that has four elements in it, you want to loop from zero to three, which is the length minus one. So we'll loop from zero to instructors.length minus one and we'll write out each instructor's name in the console window. There were six of them. There we go. And you'll see in the console window, there they are. You can also, if you want, do the same thing for arrays that contain complex data, like our writers array. So we'll loop from zero to writers.length minus one. We'll write out, in each case, the index and the writers parentheses i, the index writers, zero, then one, then two, then three, and we'll call their toString method to retrieve the information. I should point out this toString method is redundant here because when I pass this through console.writeline, they automatically call the toString method for me. So that was a little redundant. But we'll loop through here, retrieve the toString method of each of the writers in turn. There are four of them. And we'll see in the output window here the four writers one at a time. Now you can also use for each. Here I'm looping through the trainers array. Trainers contains five of the trainers. And for each trainer as string in the trainers array, this type has to match the type of thing in the array. For each trainer as string in trainers, I'm going to print out the trainer. And in each case, that's the name of the trainer. As we visit each one in our for each loop, we'll see the output in our console window. You can do the same for each loop with objects. Here, I'm going to loop through our writers array. For each WRT as writer in writers, well, writers has within it uh, four writers, number zero through three. We don't care about the index when we use a for each loop, and so we visit each one in turn I'll step over that method from now on. And there we go. We see our writers appearing in our console window. Finally, you can pass an array as a parameter to a method. Here I have a method called print elements, and I'm going to pass in our array named friends. Friends are six friends, there we go. And we'll pass them to the print elements method as a parameter. So let's walk into that. And you'll see the only tricky part of this is you have to accept the parameter here as an array. However you declare it, you have to have it with the open close parentheses indicating that it is an array. Now I've declared it as an object array so I can print out any kind of array you hand to me. As long as it's a one-dimensional array, no matter what's in the array, I can accept it because an array of anything inherits from array of object. So array of object is always of the type you pass in. So here I have an array of strings, but this is perfectly fine. I do check to make sure the array.rank is one, although I'm not sure that's really necessary. It can't hurt to check the rank property, which tells you how many dimensions you have in the array. If the rank is one, I'm going to loop through all the elements. And now I'll loop from i as integer equals zero, to array to print dot length minus one, you have to subtract one so you don't go past the end of the array. And we'll display here the array name, the index you're on, and the particular element within the array. If I run this full speed, you'll see that that print elements procedure displayed this information in the output window. So you've seen now how to fill arrays, how to retrieve information from arrays, and how to pass arrays as parameters. You can create procedures that accept an unknown number of parameters. The procedure treats those parameters as an array. 
Just like the last example where you actually passed an array, you can pass an unknown number of parameters and the compiler will collapse them down into an array. The code then can iterate through the parameter array. The string.format method works this way, haven't you noticed? You can pass two, three, four, or more parameters. All it requires is you adding a special keyword to the parameter in your procedure's declaration. The param array keyword indicates to the VB compiler that what follows is an array of parameters, and you can pass as many as you like in that spot. We'll see an example of this next. To demonstrate this technique, I'll choose option C, method parameters. And this takes us to a procedure which demonstrates first using the string.format method. String.format is happy taking in three parameters, a template and two items. Or here, we have seven parameters. It says six parameters. It's really seven. We have the template plus six more strings we're passing through. And it'll display that just as well, too. So that's a built-in class, but what about one of your own? Well, this method, print all, displays for us a list of everything it gets sent. I'm passing in a string, an integer, a date time value, and a new writer object. Well, the new writer, when we step into this, we'll call the constructor for the writer object. There we go. And the print all method uses the param array keyword. Here's the trick. Param array tells .NET, tells VB's runtime, to collapse all of the parameters into an array of objects. So I can loop through them one at a time. Without the param array keyword, I'd have to supply a real array. I didn't create an array. I just had a list of values. The param array keyword causes VB to collapse them down into an array. And I can treat them as a normal array. For each object in items, I'll print out to the console window the toString method of each item. The right line method calls the toString method of whatever it's printing, and will use that method to display the output in the console window. And there we go. Each of these was converted to a string. Here's the date time value as a string. Here's the writer as a string. In any case, the param array keyword isn't something you'll use every day. But when you need it, it's really useful. Now there's some rules you have to follow when you're using these auto array parameters. The parameter has got to be the final parameter, that array that's automatically created for you. There can't be any parameters after this special parameter. You can only include one of them. Obviously, if it has to be the last one, there can only be one of them. You can pass an explicit array if you want, as opposed to a list of values. And the compiler will figure out what to do. The great part about this auto-created array parameter is you can either pass an array or a list of values. Either way, it will work for you. Arrays appear all over the .NET framework. There are lots of places within the framework you'll find methods that return arrays. For example, string.split returns an array of strings after it splits a string into words. Process.getProcesses returns an array of currently running processes. ServiceController.getServices returns an array containing all of the currently installed Windows services. Let's look at an example that shows off a couple of these. Let's try the Arrays in the Framework option, D, and use some methods provided by the .NET Framework. We'll start by demonstrating the string.split method. We'll create a string with multiple words and call the split method of that string. This returns an array of strings. And as you see, I've created an array of strings here to hold the output. I didn't specify the size because at runtime, the array gets created with exactly enough room to hold all the words that the split method returns. Here, I step through that. Now, words contains the eight words returned from text to split. And we can now loop through those all using our print all method you just saw to display all of those words into the console window. If we go look, 
There they are. Okay, another example. The process.getProcesses method. It's a shared method of the process class, and it returns an array of process objects. Now we'll fill in our processes array, and you can see here, there's the array full of running processes. We could choose any one of them to see what it is and get information about it. I'd like to display information about each process. Now I can't call print all because the toString method doesn't give us anything useful. They didn't provide useful information in the toString method. So I'm going to have to loop through them myself, and in this case, I'll print out the process name and the working set 64 property of that process, displaying each item in the console window. The concept's the same, however. We have a method that returns an array of some .NET framework type, and there are lots of methods like this within the .NET framework. There's a list of processes and their current working set size.